According to the late Father Gabriel Amorth, co-founder of the International Association of Exorcists, Hitler, Stalin, ISIS, Harry Potter and yoga were all, in one way or another, touched by demonic influence. This does perhaps go some way towards explaining how he managed to rack up over 150,000 exorcisms throughout his long life. Of all of these cases, however, even he admitted openly that only a small minority had been true, legitimate cases of demonic possession. Despite this, exorcism remains more popular today than in any other time in history, where it has existed as a long-running ritual spanning centuries, continents and cultures. From personal demons to group possessions, the human battle with the devil is a long, winding history of violence, perversion and projectile vomit. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Dark Histories. It's Halloween. This is the Halloween episode. How exciting. I mean, pretty much every episode of Dark Histories is the Halloween episode, really. But, you know, this is the extra Halloween episode, I guess. So, of course, I figured we'd do something suitably Halloween-y. And we're going to be talking about exorcism. Before that, just going to quick shout out. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for your uh, submissions so far for the Christmas campfire episode. Got plenty already, which is amazing because, as I say every year, it's it's pretty much my favourite episode of the year. And, you know, the more submissions, the better. I'll just keep making episodes and the more kind of Christmas campfire episodes we'll get over Christmas. So, um, yeah, if you want to send in your submission, please do so. You've got until... I guess the 20th of December to to get it in. So yeah, uh, if you want to do that, then get your email into me, contact at Dark Histories. Anyway, we'll drop that there and get on with the episode. This is Demonic Possession and Exorcism Through the Ages. In 1973, the world watched on in excited horror as Reagan McNeil fought against the demonic possession from Captain Howdy. The relatively innocent sounding pet name should given to Pazazu, the king of wind demons, a character from Assyrian mythology with a human body, a dog's head, taloned bird-like feet and a scorpion's tail. Deep underground, in a pitch-black landscape, Pazazu flew above the heads of millions of souls as they stumbled blindly through the desert plains of the underworld. Summoned via an innocuous-looking Ouija board, the film inspired both fear and a huge escalation of interest in both Ouija and demonic exorcism. In the years following the film's release, demand for exorcism skyrocketed, eventually causing the Vatican to re-evaluate their public stance on exorcism and open the gates to new trainee exorcists. And today, exorcism is more popular than any time in history. The film and the original book, published by William Blatty in 1971, was itself based on a case of exorcism performed in Maryland in 1949. A Catholic newspaper says that a priest has freed a 14-year-old boy of reported possession by the devil. The boy, a resident of nearby Mount Rainier, Maryland, is said to have had a number of eerie experiences earlier this year. His bed swayed, he was tipped out of a heavy chair, and a blanket on which he was lying on the floor slid under a bed in an unexplained fashion. Born in 1935, Ronald Hunkeler was 14 years old when he began hearing unexplainable knocking and scratching noises within his bedroom walls that started every night at 7pm and continued through to midnight for 10 days straight. The family called in pest control in January of 1949, believing the sounds to be a rat problem, but nothing was found indicating pests and soon enough the sounds began escalating as footsteps were heard in the hallways, furniture moved by itself and Ronald's bed began shaking in random, violent outbursts of activity. Having fairly hardened religious and spiritualist leanings, Ronald's mother and grandmother began to believe that the spirit of Ronald's aunt Tilly, who had died in January from complications of multiple sclerosis, was the culprit, and so they contacted Reverend Luther Miles Schultz, the minister in the local Lutheran Church of St. Stephen's in Washington, D.C. In turn, the Reverend directed the case to Father Edward Albert Hughes, the Catholic priest who allegedly carried out the initial exorcism in Georgetown University Hospital during a stay between February the 28th and March the 3rd of that year. At the same time, Joseph Rhine, the director of parapsychology at Duke University, who investigated the case under a scientific eye, concluded that it had been a possibly genuine occurrence that warranted 
thoughtful examination. The most well-documented events of the case took place at the Reverend Schultz's house when he took Ronald home one night to test whether or not the phenomena would follow the boy or continue at the Hunkler home, even with Ronald absent. About midnight, unable to sleep because of the shaking of the bed, the boy sat in a heavy armchair with a very low centre of gravity. The chair moved several inches. Then he placed his knees under his chin with his feet on the edge of the chair. The chair backed up three inches against the wall. When it could move no further in that direction, it slowly tipped over, throwing the boy to the floor. This took place, Reverend Schultz maintains, while the light was on and while he himself stood in front of the chair watching. At about three the same morning, with the light still on, the boy was lying on the floor between two blankets spread out in the centre of the room, in a space about six by eight feet, where Reverend Schultz had placed him to get away from tipping furniture. Twice, he and his bedding moved slowly to a spot under the bed. His head and hands at that time, Reverend Schultz reports, were in full view. His body appeared to be rigid, and there was no wrinkling of the bedding, such as would be expected if the boy were hitching himself forward by muscular effort of some kind. Following the events at his own house, Schultz recommended Ronald visit a mental hygiene clinic in Maryland, but after partaking in a series of tests, nothing abnormal was found. At home, however, things were going drastically downhill, as scratches were found on Ronald's body, many which were suspected of trying to spell words, whilst the skin was described as having been ripped by claws. When Ronald began screaming blasphemous remarks towards Father Hughes, the Hunkler family sought the aid of a group of Jesuit priests from St Louis, headed up by William Bowden, who performed over a dozen exorcisms over the span of three months on Ronald, beginning in his aunt's house in St Louis and ending up in the psychiatric ward of the Alexian Brothers Hospital after he was moved into care when the exorcisms became too dangerous to be carried out at home, both due to the violence directed towards the priests and for Ronald's safety after he attempted to take his own life. Fortunately, one of the priests was on hand to stop him throwing himself into a nearby river. During the rituals, Ronald spat at the priest, made strange howling and growling noises, spoke in Latin, and scratches spontaneously appeared all over his body. Once in hospital, he was restrained and a final exorcism took place in mid-April of 1949, ending four months of trauma for Ronald and the Hunkler family. Although it has now become the archetypal story of exorcism, defining the process in the mind of the popular imagination due to its adaptation and depiction in the book and film, exorcism has existed in various guises throughout history and culture. Documented cases have been unearthed that suggest that William Blatty's story of Reagan and Captain Howdy was probably based on far more than a single case from 1949. The Venerable Bede wrote of St Juliana of Nicomedia in the 8th century tome Martyrology, a historical list of Christian martyrs organised to fit the Christian calendar. According to Bede, St Juliana was born in Nicomedia, the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, towards the end of the 3rd century, during a time of Christian persecution. The daughter of a pagan officer, she was betrothed to Eleusius, a fellow pagan and member of the Senate, close to the emperor. Having secretly converted to Christianity, Juliana refused the marriage outright. But not especially keen on rejection, Eleusius imprisoned her, tortured her, and eventually ordered her to be beheaded. Juliana's life went on to become a popular story of martyrdom in the Middle Ages, and in the 9th century was rewritten by the old English poet known as Cunewal, an Anglo-Saxon Christian writer, likely a man of the Catholic Church, who gave the story a whole new spin. In Cunewal's version of events, during her imprisonment, Juliana was visited by a demon, the enemy of mankind skilled in evil, though he took the form of an angel in order to trick her into supplying pagan sacrifices. Juliana is not so easily fooled and asks God who or what the angel is, God tells her in reply to hold on to him tight and to force him to admit to his demonic origins, which he does with some delight. To deliver up to death the king of all kings, and I wrought that the warrior wounded the lord of hosts, while the army gazed upon it, until that blood and water together fell to the ground. I stirred up Herod in heart, that he gave order to behead John, for that he reproved with words his love of his wife, his unrighteous wedlock. Also with malice I taught Simon, so that he began to strive against the chosen followers of Christ, and with shame assailed those holy men, saying that they were wizards. With sharp wiles, I dared to delude Nero, so that he bade the followers of Christ, Peter and Paul, be given over unto death. By my teachings did Pilate formally hang upon the cross the ruler of the heavens, the mighty Lord. 
In likewise also did I incite Hegias, so that in his folly he bade the holy Andrew to be hanged to a high tree, and sent forth his spirit from the gallows in a splendour of glory. Thus among my brothers I wrought many a deed of evil, of black sin, which I may not tell, nor fully relate, nor know the countless number of my cruel, malicious thoughts. Sent by the king of the inhabitants of hell in order to pervert the hearts of the righteous, the demon goes on to explain the entire nature and purpose of demons on earth, ensnaring people in the delights of sin, installing vices into their minds, and inspiring wicked desires of the heart in an effort to sacrifice them to the prince of evil and destroy their spirit. With the demon's confessions out in the open, he is cast back to a humiliating imprisonment in the kingdom of hell and Juliana is freed from his presence. Despite her victory over the demon, the ending of the story is no less harsh than the original and Cunewulf describes her being boiled in molten lead by Lucius. When the lead miraculously fails to burn her skin, her would-be suitor decides instead to simply chop off her head, cementing her as a Christian martyr. Although more of a twist on a modern-day exorcism, the story of Juliana has much in common with the later rituals, and the demon's grisly descriptions of his wicked deeds set a precedent that is seen repeatedly with demonic possession for centuries to come. It wasn't until the medieval period was fading and the Renaissance was in full swing that exorcism would truly flesh out into the recognisable ritual we know from modern films and literature. A common form of publishing from the 15th century onwards came in the form of chapbooks, small pamphlets that were peddled around market towns, often priced at a penny or less, and at times bartered for small trade goods like scraps of cloth and linen. In rural England, they were often the sole reading material available for the rural working classes, and without a doubt, the only available material that dealt with news from outside of the local area for many. In 1584, one such pamphlet was published in Somerset, South West England, with the curious title of Demonic Possession and boasting the inclusion of a woodblock print picturing the devil in the form of a headless bear. Inside, the pamphlet told the story of Margaret Cooper, a farmer's wife from a small town named Ditchit. On the 9th of May, 1854, Margaret had set out on a 60-mile trek to the neighbouring county of Gloucestershire in order to undertake some business on their farm in place of her husband, who had recently been laid up sick in bed. Upon her return home, her husband noticed some small changes in Margaret's personality, chiefly that she seemed to talk relentlessly, concerned with matters that he thought were of little importance. This idle chatter continued for six days until, on Tuesday the 15th of May, Margaret woke from her morning rest and burst into an abrupt assault of chatter. She was, he decided, unnaturally vain and conceited, and so fearing some kind of interference from a wicked spirit, he persuaded her to sit with him and repeat the Lord's Prayer. Resting on their knees, the couple began their recital, but before they could complete it, Margaret broke from her lines, screaming at her husband to show her some money and a wedding ring. Fearing for his wife, he continued with the Lord's Prayer, desperately pacing through the lines, repeating it over and over. As every verse passed from his lips, however, Margaret seemed to deteriorate further and further into a delirious, desperate anger. Realising the urgency of the situation, he called for Margaret's brother and sister, who promptly arrived at the farm cottage and leapt into action. They kept her down violently in the bed, and forthwith she was sore tormented that she foamed at the mouth and was shaken with such force that the bed and the chamber did shake and move in most such strange sort. Her husband continued praying for her deliverance, so that within one half hour after her shaking was left, she began to tell them that she had been in town to beat away the bear which followed her into the yard when she came out of the country, which, to her thinking, had no head. Then her husband and friends persuaded her to leave those vain imaginations, persuading her that it was nothing but the lightness of her brain which was become idle for want of rest. Wherefore her husband and friends persuaded her to say the Lord's Prayer with them, which she did, and after took some small rest, and thus they remained until the Sunday following, in which time she continued raging as it were bestraught of her memory, which came by fits to the great grief of her husband, friends and neighbours. As time passed by, Margaret began to show signs of some small recovery, and by the following weekend, she was, for the most part, found lying peacefully in bed, weak, but in a generally calm and relaxed state, 
only falling into occasional small bouts of vacant speech. That Sunday, however, saw Margaret once more fall into some kind of trance, where she relayed to her husband a vision she had of a snail carrying a burning flame. Noticing the candle had burned clean out on Margaret's bedside table, he called to her brother and sister once more to bring a fresh candle into the dark room. As they entered and lit the wick of the replacement, the room filled with a dim orange light. Margaret began then to wear as one very fearful, saying to her husband and the rest, You do not see the devil, whereat they desired her to remember God and to call for grace, that her faith might be only fixed upon him to the vanquishing of the devil and his assaults. Well, quoth she, if you see nothing now, you shall see something by and by, and forthwith they heard a noise in the street, as it had been coming of two or three carts, and presently they in the chamber cried out, saying, Lord, help us, what manner of thing is this that cometh here? Then her husband, looking up in his bed, espied a thing come to the bed, much like unto a bear, but it had no head nor tail, half a yard in length and half a yard in height. Her husband, seeing it, came up to the bed, rose up and took a joined stool and struck at the said thing. The stroke sounded as though he had broken upon a feather bed. Then it came to the woman and struck her three times upon the feet and took her out of the bed and so rolled her to and fro in the chamber and under the bed. The people there present, to the number of seven persons, were so greatly amazed with this horrible sight that they knew not what to do, yet they called still upon God for his assistance. But the candle was so dim that they could scarcely see one another. At the last, this monster, which we supposed to be the devil, did thrust the woman's head between her legs, and so rolled her in a round compass like a hoop through three other chambers, down a high pair of stairs into the hall, where he kept her the space of a quarter of an hour. Her husband, and they in the chamber above, dared not come down to her, but remained in prayer, weeping at the stair's head, grievously lamenting to see her so carried away. There was such a horrible stink in the hall, and such fiery flames, that they were glad to stop their noses with cloths and napkins. Eventually, Margaret cried out to the crowd of people in the house that the demon had gone, and called for them to come back to her room. Rushing up the stairs, they collected Margaret from the floor and placed her in bed, covering her in a blanket, whilst four of the terrified onlookers sat on each corner, attempting in vain to pin her down. Suddenly, the woman was got out of bed, and the window at the bed's head opened. Whether the woman did unpin the window, or how it cameth to pass, they knew not, but it was opened, and the woman's legs, after a marvellous manner, thrust out at the window, so that they were clasped about the post in the middle of the window between her legs. The people in the chamber heard a thing knock at her feet as it had been upon a tub, and they saw a great fire as it seemed to them at her feet, the stink whereof was horrible. The sorrowful husband and his brother, emboldened themselves in the Lord, did charge the devil in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost, to depart from her and to trouble her no more. Then they laid hands on her and cried to the Lord to help them in their great need, and so pulled her in again and sat her upon her feet. Then she looked out of a window and began to say, O Lord, quoth she, methinks I see a little child, but they gave no regard to her. These words she spake two or three times, so at the last they all looked out at the window, and lo, they espied a thing like unto a little child with very bright shining countenance, casting a great light into the chamber. And then the candle burned very brightly, so that they might see one another. Then they fell flat to the ground and praised the Lord that they had so wonderfully assisted them, and so the child vanished away. Then the woman, being in some better feeling of herself, was laid in her bed, and asked forgiveness at God's hands, and all of that that she had offended, acknowledging that it was for her sins that she was tormented of the evil spirit. The story of Margaret Hooper ended with the signatures of six named witnesses that swore to the truth of the tale. Interestingly, the story was printed twice more, once in 1614 and again in 1641, though all three differ in the details, including the changing of the names of the main protagonists and the date of which the events were purported to have happened. Whether true or not, the pamphlet did tell a story of clear demonic possession and exorcism and shows how such events had evolved over the previous centuries. As it happened, the 1600s would go on to prove to be one of the most sensational in the entire history of exorcism. Not, of course, because of a headless bear in Somerset, but due to an Ursuline convent across the channel in central France, itself the inspiration for a book 
play, opera and film released two years before The Exorcist, the incident that would become known as the Devils of Lorden is one of the most infamous cases of exorcism in all history. With the town reeling from a recent bout of plague that had killed almost one quarter of the local population, the convent at Loudon was founded in 1626, overseen by the prioress Jeanne de Belsier, more commonly referred to as Jeanne de Angers, the convent was stationed by 17 nuns, all of whom were young women in their 20s and most of whom had noble backgrounds, with parental links to barons, cardinals and government officials. Events at Loudon began in secret at first, with the newly formed institution seeking to conceal any unnatural happenings in order to limit the negative impact it might have on the fragile, fledgling community. At the time, Catholicism was the dominant religion in France, and though Protestants were the majority in Loudon, the denomination was on the defensive as a whole, and despite its bourgeois inhabitants, the convent itself was not a rich one, and depended heavily on charity and a small income from teaching young girls from the town. In September of 1632, Jeanne d'Angers was the first to succumb to strange behaviour, coming across with bouts of nervous irritability, convulsions and hallucinations, which quickly spread through the building as the sisters fell like dominoes, claiming to see visions of ungodly spectres late at night. Rumours that the convent was haunted increased as various sisters claimed to not only see ghostly visions of the recently deceased convent priest hovering over their beds crying, but would also claim he attacked them too, as they felt invisible hands slap them in the dark. Sleepwalking became endemic, and several of the nuns were shaken awake at night, only to find that they had stepped out of bed and clambered onto the roof, much to their shock and surprise. Doctors and apothecaries were quietly called in, but to no avail, and gradually, word of the unusual behaviours crept out of the borders of the convent and into the town at large, sparking gossip in the streets that the sisters of Loudon were possessed by demons. Despite the waning belief in exorcism within the public sphere in the 17th century, it was eventually deemed necessary to resort to the ritual of exorcism after medical efforts proved unsuccessful, and all signs pointed to the confirmation that the sisters were suffering from a demonic influence. As regards the presence of devils in the possessed, the church teaches us in its ritual that there are four principal signs by which it can be undoubtedly recognised. These signs are the speaking of or understanding of a language unknown to the person possessed, the revelation of the future or of events happening far away, the exhibition of strength beyond the years and nature of the actor and the floating in the air for a few moments. The church does not require, in order to have recourse to exorcisms, that all these marks should be found in the same subject. One alone, if well authenticated, is sufficient to demand public exorcism. Now, they are all to be found in the nuns of Loudon, and in such numbers that we can only mention the principal cases. Acquaintance with unknown tongues first showed itself in the Mother Superior. At the beginning, she answered in Latin the questions of the ritual proposed to her in that language, Later, she and the others answered in any language they thought proper to question in. The exorcisms were performed by numerous different clergymen from various religious orders and churches throughout the region, and reports were made by all of the sisters speaking in languages as diverse as Turkish, Spanish, Italian, Greek, German and Latin, whilst convulsing, blaspheming and exposing themselves to the exorcists who were forced to hide their eyes in shame. Now the nuns of Loudon gave these proofs daily. When the exorcist gave some order to the devil, the nuns suddenly passed from a state of quiet into the most terrible convulsions and without the slightest increase of pulsation. They struck their chests and backs with their heads as if they had had their neck broken and with inconceivable rapidity. They twisted their arms at the joints of the shoulder, the elbow and the wrist two or three times round. Lying on their stomachs, they joined their palms of their hands to the soles of their feet. Their faces became so frightful, one could not bear to look at them. Their eyes remained open without winking. Their tongues issued suddenly from their mouths, horribly swollen, black, hard and covered with pimples, and yet while in this state, they spoke distinctly. They threw themselves back till their heads touched their feet, and they walked in this position with wonderful rapidity and for a long time. They uttered cries so horrible and so loud that nothing like it was ever heard before. 
They made use of expressions so indecent as to shame the most debauched of men, while their acts, both in exposing themselves and inviting lewd behaviour from those present, would have astonished the inmates of the lowest brothel in the country. They uttered maledictions against the three divine persons of the Trinity, oaths and blasphemous expressions so execrable, so unheard of, that they could not have suggested themselves to the human mind. They used to watch without rest and fast five or six days at a time, or be tortured twice a day as we have described during several hours, without their health suffering. On the contrary, those that were somewhat delicate appeared healthier than before their possession. Levitation was described by several members of the convent, including the Mother Superior, who reportedly levitated two feet above the floor during one exorcism, and whilst the general health of the nuns was said to improve, some bore physical wounds from their ordeals, including the Mother Superior, who foretold a grouping of three wounds that would appear on her side in a forthcoming exorcism. On the prophesied day, doctors were called in to witness three wounds, exactly as described, appear miraculously under the hand of the nun, who blamed it on the devil. Unable to conceal the situation any longer, the convent fell into poverty as charity and students were promptly withdrawn and mistrust fell heavily over the building. As the weeks rolled on, exorcism became part of the daily rituals within the convent walls. All of the sisters were subjected to exorcisms and often multiple times per day. Most were carried out publicly in one of the four local churches of the town and as word spread of the situation, tourists from across France poured into Loudon to watch the bizarre situation unravel. On October the 5th, Jeanne d'Anger was subjected to an exorcism which unfurled the direness of the situation when she declared that she was possessed by seven different demonic entities, including Asmodeus, the demonic representation of lust who ruled over other demons as a prince in hell. Some clarity was found when, six days later, during another exorcism, one of the nuns named a local priest named Urban Grandier as the magician and ultimate culprit for the situation, the man who had summoned the demons and driven them to possess the sisters. A womanizer who had recently survived a trial, relatively unscathed for getting a pupil pregnant, Grandier was well known in the town, though not always for the best reasons, and he had many enemies. His contact with the convent had been limited after he had turned down an offer to take on the role as the convent priest after the recent death of the previous priest whose ghost had kick-started the whole demonic affair, and it was likely that he had never actually met any of the nuns at all. Despite this, the sisters clung onto the belief that he was behind all of their ills and insisted that the demons inside of them were exposing his cruelties. Grandier was arrested on November 30th, 1633, over a year after the possessions had started. It had been a gruelling 13 months for the nuns, who had seen themselves made a spectacle of by the exorcists, who played up the rituals for the crowds. Grandier insisted upon his innocence, even under extreme torture, but it was to no avail. During his trial, several women gave evidence that he had seduced them and promised to make them princess of the magicians, whilst the nuns insisted that he had been sneaking into the convent for months in order to work his dark magic against the inhabitants. The sisters were observed for over 40 days, whilst the exorcisms were examined closely and various proofs of magic were collected, all as crazy as the last. Found guilty and sentenced to death on August 18, 1634, Grandier was marched into the town square, tied to a pyre, and burned alive. With Grandier now dead, one might have expected the nun's possessions to have ended, but that was not to be the case, and in many respects the situation only worsened. Jeanne d'Anger fell into a phantom pregnancy and claimed to be carrying a demonic child, but was fortunately saved by the exorcist who commanded the unborn child to vanish, which it apparently did. In December of 1634, Father Surin, a new principal exorcist, was brought in to shore up the problem and he attempted to do so with brutal impunity, carrying out exorcisms that were physically violent as well as intensely demoralising and psychologically distressing for the sisters, who were forced to strip down and whip themselves in efforts to punish the demons inside. These exorcisms lasted several years but were eventually successful and all the demons were driven out of the sisters, the final demon being exorcised in January of 1636. Father Surin resolved to compel the last demon that remained in the Mother Superior to adore Jesus Christ. He had the lady tied to a bench. 
The exorcisms drove the demon into a fury, and instead of obeying, he vomited a multitude of maledictions and blasphemies against the three persons of the Holy Trinity, against Jesus Christ, and against his Holy Mother, so execrable that one would be horrified to read them. The father knew that he was about to come out, and he had the lady unbound. After trembling, contortions, and horrible howlings, Father Surin pressed him more and more with the Holy Sacrament in his hand, and ordered him in Latin to write the name of Mary on the lady's hand. Raising her left arm into the air, the fiend redoubled his cries and howls, and in a last convulsion issued from the lady, leaving on her hand the holy name Maria, in letters so perfectly formed that no human hand could imitate them. The lady felt herself free and full of joy, and a te deum was sung in honour of the event. In the process of the exorcisms, the convent had fallen to moral and financial ruin. Many of the sisters had left, dispersing across France seeking anonymity from the situation and returning the town to a quiet existence. Precisely what was going on in Loudon was debated both at the time and for years after. Far from being an isolated case, Loudon was one of 45 cases of mass possession in convents across the globe between 1435 and 1690 many of which shared similarities in the details of their possessions. On two occasions, including in Loudon, a crucifix was used as an object of passion by the possessed, just as it was in Blatty's book, centuries later. By the end of the century, opinions on exorcism changed considerably, and with the Enlightenment in full swing, many religious orders sought to distance themselves from talk of demons, devils and exorcism, as a new scientific angle took over in all walks of life. Many of the old traditions were discussed with a degree of embarrassment and disdain by even the most fundamental ministers, though belief in the supernatural was still strong in the more rural communities across Europe and America. This strange clash of beliefs becomes particularly evident when comparing theological texts and folk pamphlets of the 18th and 19th centuries where the beliefs of the ordinary people have been able to bleed out to a wider audience as the centuries have passed. This is witnessed in the account of Joseph Pitkin, an American merchant, sheriff and justice of the peace from Connecticut, who was visiting Boston on business when he crossed paths with a young 23-year-old woman named Martha Robertson, who claimed she was possessed by the devil. Martha had heard rumours of Pitkin's presence in the town and thought, judging by his dress, that he was a minister she sent for him at his place of lodging. At first, Pitkin had been perplexed as to why she had called for him at all, but was soon given reason to feel some concern when she replied that the devil is disturbed at your coming. He knows you are a good man, and he hates all such, and he will roar in me anon. Martha had had a fairly tumultuous religious existence before her meeting with Pitkin. When she was younger, she had visited a touring preacher, having been inspired by his speech but had found herself falling into a demonic fit the moment she was in his presence. The devil filled me with such rage and spite against him that I could have torn him to pieces and should have torn his clothes off if my friends had not held me, she told Pickin. The preacher left the room and collected four or five ministers who all came into the room and prayed over Martha for the remainder of the night, though it didn't seem to have much success, and she spent the entire time tossing around the room, filled with rage and spite against all good people. She also spent the night swearing, blaspheming and dancing. In more recent times, she told Pitkin that she'd been possessed by the devil for the past 15 weeks. Pitkin agreed to pray with her and the two spent a difficult evening whilst Martha flipped in and out of demonic fits that saw her scream and shout in rage before relaxing back into her usual calm self and continue with prayer. This continued for several nights, between which Martha said she sat up in bed and could hear the bleating of goats in the dark street outside, as well as terrifying gusts of wind that threatened to take off the roof of her house. In stark difference to other cases of exorcism, Martha was gradually restored to her usual self, not by a dramatic plea to God, but gradually over time, and her story is concluded when Pitkin visits her two years later and she is already at peace. Pitkin's diary is set at a time when old lights, those who held the traditional views of the church battled with the progressive ideas of the new lights, the religious who believed in the emerging philosophies of a more personal, informal form of religion. The touring preacher that first bore witness to Martha's possession was one of the new lights, and Pitkin accused him of attempting to exorcise Martha and of even placing a demon within her himself, 
both of which were heretical charges to the Calvinist Americans of the time. Far from being a shunned praxis, exorcism amongst the general populace, at least in America during the time of the Enlightenment, was alive and kicking, and part of a much bigger debate within religion itself. Exorcism was not a fusty ritual destined to the footnotes in an age of science, but rather discarded by the old lights as an over-emotional practice, better suited to the tactless new lights and their disruptive ways. As the Enlightenment progressed, however, new ideas permeated throughout society. Exorcism did eventually fall out of favour in almost all levels of religion. Cases did not dry up completely, and exorcisms were still carried out throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, but at a much reduced rate. This did not stop them from being sensational, however, and some of the most spectacular events to be recorded have come from within this time period. The exorcism of Anna Eklund is one such case, taking place in Iowa of 1928. Sensational in the extreme, it is perhaps only upstaged by one other case from South Africa in 1906 when a young Zulu girl was reportedly possessed by the devil whilst attending a Catholic missionary school. Orphaned as an infant shortly after her birth in 1890, Clara Germana Celle was baptised and raised at St Michael's Mission, a Catholic reserve surrounded by trees and hills in the province of Natal on the eastern coast of South Africa. Outside of her situation as an orphan, there is very little known of Clara's life for the first 16 years. However, it's doubtful that it was one of particular happiness, given the veiled references to her being a victim of sexual abuse around the age of 6 or 7, made by Reverend Erasmus Horner, who later wrote about the case in 1927. An intelligent child, she had been described as having a good memory, adept at feminine handiwork, such as knitting and sewing, and was fond of playing tricks whilst at school, though she always acted honestly. It was events that kicked off in July of 1906 that Clara's case is most famous for, after she approached the reverend during confession, handing him a scrawled note that pledged her soul to the devil. The Bishop of Natal, Henri de Lau, was called into the mission in order to question Clara, but when he demanded to know the name of the demon, she refused to speak his name aloud. She spout out the letters D-I-O-A-R, though who or what she was referring to fails to match up with any known demon in religion or folklore. Far from being one of her usual tricks, however, events soon escalated beyond the realm of the natural when Clara began speaking in several different languages, including Latin, German and Polish. She climbed the walls on her hands and knees and floated in the air six feet from the floor. As two of the resident nuns struggled to pull her back down to the floor, they found themselves lifted from the ground by the force of the levitation. The only way they were eventually able to bring her down was to sprinkle her feet with holy water. Doctors were called in and opium pills were administered in the vain hope that they might sedate her enough to keep her on the ground, but the drugs had no effect and on one particularly shocking evening, Clara ignited in a scene of spontaneous combustion, her skirt bursting into flame in front of a handful of terrified witnesses. Bishop Delau continued to question her and when he and the Reverend discovered that she appeared to possess some form of telepathic power, including knowing the movements of both the Bishop and the Reverend, as well as people of the clergy in Rome that she had never met, he promptly authorised Reverend Horner to carry out an exorcism. Beginning the exorcism proper, I grasped in my left hand the stole which had been placed about Germana's neck and drew it firmly under her chin. With the right hand, I held the ritual. Father Apollinarius had hold of my shoulder to steady me. Several sisters had come into the sanctuary so that seven or eight were present and there were also the eight large, strong girls. All who could clung to the raving and howling Germana, and all, together with Germana and her chair, were lifted up free of the floor. I was witness to this myself, as well as the sisters in the chapel and the school children in the main body of the church. Germana presented a terrible sight, her face being horribly distorted, and her savage howling and wild blows rendering the scene still more awful. Sister Lucardis received a powerful blow that left a blue mark on her arm, Meanwhile, I continued the exorcism with all my strength so that the perspiration rolled down my face. The poor girl became increasingly violent. Her entire body swelled out as if distended by bellows. Her eyes fairly pierced me with rage and some invisible power lifted both her and those holding her up from the floor. Finally, I ordered her hands clapped in handcuffs and her arms and feet tied together, but this proved a gigantic task. 
Meanwhile, Sister Hilaria and Sister Savatia, the superiors of the mission schools at St. Michael's and Himmelberg, had arrived, saying that even at a distance, the air seemed filled with sounds of a wild howling. Though everyone who could possibly approach Germana assisted in trying to put her in bonds, we succeeded only after three hours in finally handcuffing her. Her arms were stiff and almost unbendable, and she was continually being lifted up with her chair by the evil one, amid ear-deafening noises and pandemonium. Finally, Sister Anacleta succeeded in seizing the raving girl with both arms clutched about her waist, while Sister Lugardis and Sister Savatia, with the aid of the girls, bound her feet and limbs. While Dramana's right arm was being clapped into the handcuff, she suddenly jerked the arm from the two girls holding it and clutched Sister Anacleta with such an iron hold about the throat that she was nearly choked. At the same time, Germana and the chair on which she was sitting soared so high into the air that the sister, though quite tall, touched the floor only with the point of her shoes. Only a concerted effort of all present freed the sister from Germana's throttling clutch. Hardly had the feet been tied then that the rope broke, but when the sisters, in their efforts to bind her still more securely, placing their weight upon her limbs to hold her down, they were lifted up from the floor together with the possessed girl, Continuing, however, the prayers of the exorcism, I commanded the evil spirit in the name of God and of the church to abandon his victim. The exorcism continued throughout the night in a violent fashion. At one point, Clara bit one of the sisters trying to restrain her, leaving a red row of teeth marks on the skin, and in the centre of the wound, a blister swelled, filling with fluid, in what was described as something like a snake bite. Finally, long after sunrise, Clara slumped to the floor. There she writhed and twisted like one in the agony of death, and then stretched out full length. All was over. Germana was freed from the terrible demon. The struggle ended at half past nine in the morning, September the 3rd, 1906, in the Mission Church of St. Michael. The exorcism seemed to have been successful, but throughout, the demon had swore blind to the priests that he would return in even more terrible circumstances. So just to be sure, the priest repeated the process again the following night. Despite the demon's threats, the second exorcism was a decidedly less violent affair, as Clara sat in the chair the whole time, singing happily. The demon would wait for another six months before enacting his return, which he eventually did in March of 1907, just after Reverend Horner had left the mission bound for Europe. In his absence, the Bishop of Natal made his way back to the reserve and performed a third exorcism on Clara and on one other girl named Monica Molech, who was also claiming to have been possessed in April of that year. Alongside five other priests, the bishop spent a gruelling day from morning till night fighting the demons within the two girls, casting several different entities out in quick succession, returning both girls to their natural selves. When meditating on the possessions years after the fact, Reverend Horner seemed to conclude that he believed Clara to truly have been possessed and not suffering from any psychological illness, calling the suggestion that she had fallen temporarily insane, contrary to all logical and common sense. Following the supernatural events at the mission, Clara went on to live for another six years trouble-free from demons before she died of consumption in 1913 at the age of 22. Her story lived on in an obscure pamphlet published by the Marianne Hill Mission Society in 1927. Despite theological problems and a long tradition of abuse, fraud and scepticism, exorcism continues unabated from ancient Mediterranean Christians with their miraculous scriptures through to the modern Catholic dichotomy of clinical psychology and incense smoke. More popular than ever before, the ritual continues the world over, and as questionable as the practice becomes for the unbeliever, faith only continues to grow in the devout. During the exorcism of Clara Germana, the Reverend Horner said he saw a weird fire burning in her eyes. The diabolical rage, he wrote, the hateful stare, that uncanny glow in the eyes of the possessed speak volumes, more than human tongue can utter or pen depict. There you learn to believe in the powers of darkness and their diabolical work. So that was a fairly brief sojourn of exorcism through the ages, and we shall talk a little bit about that after these short advert breaks. Welcome back. So yes, a fairly brief journey through some of the more 
sensational, I guess, sort of reported cases of exorcism over the years. I didn't really touch on any of the theories about the cases because I wanted to just sort of like, in this episode, I wanted to just sort of concentrate on the stories as they're told. Um, but, but definitely, I think several of them could be expanded out into like full, um, you know, episodes, especially uh, the Devils of Ludon, obviously, and um, the Clara Dramana exorcism in, in South Africa at the end there is uh, there is so much going on in that story. And um, it's it's woefully underrepresented on the Internet because it's it, basically everything I read about it on the Internet was was completely false almost um because and it, all it comes down to is that the book or the pamphlet i should say that was published in 1927 isn't freely available and it's quite rare and quite expensive um so of course it's essentially um mostly just repeated uh information from a, a quite poor wikipedia page um so I definitely i could expand on on that story i think generally speaking when we look at exorcism i mean we sort of have to look at like what's really going on right like there's some seriously troubling characters behind quite a lot of it and 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 in, i think i've spoke about this in the past i, I did um an episode on uh the exorcism of anna eckland which i mentioned in this episode but obviously didn't go into detail because i've, I've covered it before but generally speaking i tend to think that most cases of exorcism are fairly straightforward cases of abuse um and 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 I and that, and that's about it for me. Um, but that they are never endingly fascinating. The stories behind them, and the reasoning for those stories, whether they be sort of for social or religious reasons or or both, um, I always feel like the the sort of context behind the stories usually clues you in on on what what is really going on. And um, like I say, I think they're always usually pretty pretty fascinating sort of snippets of history you know like the, the Ludon one for for example there was a lot going on in the background there sort of in terms of the local politics Grandier was uh clearly a a bit of a character and clearly disliked and had made a lot of enemies in the local area and it basically sounded like a stitch up to me uh, but but it, but that but, but Ludon is is one of the more interesting ones in that in many respects it sounds like a stitch up but it's also multifaceted because I don't think the nuns were, were necessarily the ones performing the stitch up. I think the nuns were almost sort of like uh, sort, of, uh, sort of puppets in a, in a bigger game, if you like. Um, and, it, and and they themselves had their own reasons for for, for doing it. Um, and and it's really interesting. Um, and, and I say it, there's about two or three different levels that that kind of can explain what happened at Ludon um and that's before we even sort of touch on the whether or not it was really sort of demonic possession or not um so 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 I think it's a really fascinating story um again with the uh, the Clara Germana one um you know that that sounds like a common situation honestly it sounds like a, a troubled child it's, it's really interesting a lot of the stories the way they tell her story on, online it, and like, oh, she was a, you know, a happy child and all this. And I, and I think they do it for effects because they want to say, oh, you know, she was a happy child, an orphan, but did well at school. And, and then she went down this dark. But that's not true. Actually, she, she had an awful childhood. Her parents were um, uh, accused of witchcraft against her. Um, and it sounds like she was more than likely... Um, sexually abused uh, by her parents and the locals um, in one way or another um, when she was like six or seven years old. Um, so she didn't have a happy childhood at all, um, despite what those stories on the internet say. It's just not true. And, and I think her case is, is probably one of trauma playing out um, in a teenage girl who was then abused by, uh, you know, in the name of uh, a religious ritual, um, I think it's probably more to do with it. But what I, I think um, is interesting amongst all of these stories is that you have all these reasons, whether they be social or political or religious or, or whatever, but all of the stories are written in this um, sort of like grotesquely uh, horrific style with these kind of like, you know, 
descriptions of these demonic influences and stuff. And I find that really interesting. Um, and what I find really interesting is that they all seem to have these common threads. Um, and so for me, who is like very sceptical uh, about exorcism, but always trying to be agnostic about such things, they are immensely um, in, intriguing to read and, and they do pull you down this rabbit hole of uh, the possibilities of demonic possession and such. And, and, and so despite the fact that my, my probable answer would be that, you know, it, it was written that way, uh, you know, it's basically uh, dramatised to, to highlight certain aspects of religious belief and to instil religious fear among people. Um, yeah, despite that, that being my probable belief, I still kind of, kind of am intrigued by the idea of it all. So, yeah, probably in the future I will uh, do more about a couple of these stories um, and, and, and sort of tell, the, tell them a bit more in detail. But I hope you enjoyed the episode as it was today. Anyway, happy Halloween. I hope you have a great one, uh, whether you're out trick-or-treating or dressing up or, you know, just settling in to watch a few horror films, which is pretty much my plan. And, yeah, thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to contact me, you can do so. Email is contact at darkhistories.com. Uh, you can go to darkhistories.com, which is the website that sort of has the hub for, which is sort of the main hub for pretty much everything. You can find out all the ways of contacting me. You can get on the Discord through there. You can find all the ways in which you can support or you can buy merch or the Dark Crushes books. And you can also find links to all of this uh, in the show notes as well, if you so wish. One last call just at the end of this episode, just uh, if you would like to um, if you would like to be involved in the Christmas Campfire episode, then to send your story in before December the 20th. But otherwise, say I'll leave you there. Thanks very much for listening as always. Have a fantastic Halloween. Stay safe. Sleep tight.